All right, welcome back here in this room. Next on stage is Curtis Meloni, who is going to give us an introduction to Python logging. Give him a round of applause. Good morning, happy Sunday. I hope you enjoyed the scones. Um, as you said, I'm Curtis Maloney. There's my information, details. You can hit me up on Twitter or GitHub or IRC. That cat is kind of my avatar. You'll see it around places. That's me. It's done. Here's my cat. Um, right. I'm doing this talk basically because I run into a lot of cases where I see people using Python logging and they do it wrong. They either don't understand what facilities are there to be used and reinvent it, which I've had to dig out of a couple of projects, or they just feel it's too hard and don't use it. And Python logging can be very simple, very flexible, very powerful if you let it. So let's go for a quick introduction. Come on. I'm not focused on the right window to get the clicky. Here's the basics. You run Python, you import logging. You say, I want to log some debug information, and nothing comes out. Or some info level stuff, and nothing comes out. Or you want to log a warning, and you get a warning from root or something. And you log an error, and you get an error, a nice and big scary error. And in fact, you can catch exceptions and log the exception along with your message. It will actually grab the exception and log it for you, which looks just like I actually got the error, but didn't, honest. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Just kidding. As we saw, using logging is quite simple. Uh, what you should be doing is asking for your own logger. Just like this. You can import logging. You say, get logger. And then you log all your messages through your own logger. And there's a few different ways you can call and a few different levels. As we can see here, you can just log a straight message and uh, use the percent %s formatting. Um, to get your value passed through, you can log the exception, as we showed earlier. Or in fact, you can use the uh, more extended dict format expressions for your percent %s formatting to get more flexible messages, more information. And if you really want to go dirty, you can pass locals and just grab everything from your local scope in there, but that's probably not the best move. When we're doing this, as you saw, there were several different levels. Um, all of these levels are predefined. You can add your own levels if you want, but in the end, they all become numeric levels and are used for controlling how many messages really come out because whilst you're in production, you're not interested in your debug levels or info level stuff, you're more interested in warnings and errors and so on. So you turn that off, you quieten it down, you squelch for anyone who's into radio. But you can turn the logging level down so that you can get more information whilst you're debugging. And it's always compared with greater than or equal to. So if you set your logging level to info, you'll get info and above level messages. So you don't have to worry about saying, oh, oh, what's the level below info so that I can always get my info messages? In logging, there's these four basic players. We have loggers, log records, handlers, and formatters. Your logger, as we saw before, it's the thing you ask the logging library for, and it gives you a logger, and that's where you pass your messages to. It will, in turn, produce log records, which hold all the information about the log, an event that you have generated, and then that eventually makes its way onto handlers, which do something to output that log message somewhere. And they will often use formatters to decide how that looks. The f actual flow is something a bit like this. So you will pass your message into your logger, which will then go and create a record, which you can actually configure the record format, but you probably won't need to, then hand that message off maybe to a number of handlers, which might call out to the formatter to format it, and then pass off either just dump it in with all your logs. I couldn't find an image for disk, sorry. Uh, maybe email it or even send it off into the cloud for somebody else to deal with. The logger class is actually really simple. All of the logging code is really simple, as it turns out, as I discovered whilst researching this. 
So the logger itself has a name and a level. That check level function just turns level names into level numbers and makes sure it's a known value. A parent and propagate, which we'll get into later on. Um, a list of handlers, not just one, but a list. And then a flag to try and disable it. And as you can see, it extends the filterer class, which has a list of filters, which I'll explain in a minute. Then you have your log record which has a lot of arguments, but you never have to create it explicitly. The handler will do that for you. But it has, again, the name of the, uh, the handler, that, of the logger that it came in via, the level of this log message, and then some information about where it came from in the code base, what the file name was, what the line number was, and then the message that you passed in and the arguments you passed in, and maybe some exception information as well. Um, the function that it came from, if it's known, the stack information, and any other details that the, uh, the logger passed along to it. Whoops. It also goes and figures out what thread it's running in, if you've got threads enabled, and gets that information, the process ID and process name, if it can figure them out, um, the level name from the level number, and the file name and module that the function comes from. If it can figure these out, it will stash them on itself. It has only one real significant method, and that is get message, which takes the message you got it and just splot resolves it with the args you gave it, which is why you should always call and pass message format and list of arguments, or message format and addict of arguments, but instead of formatting yourself. Because if you leave it for the logging formatter and all the rest of it to do, means sometimes that work won't have to be done because the message will be dropped rather than actually logged. You can save your bit of performance. It's a small thing, but it can add up a lot over time. Don't do that. Then the messages are passed to handlers, which again extend filterer. So they have a list of filters as well, which we'll get into. A name which they might figure out from somewhere. That's relevant later on. Uh, again, a level and a formatter that they might use. And they have two important methods, which is handle, which is how the messages get passed into them, and emit, which is how this specific handler actually deals with messages. Handle itself is implemented by default for you, which um, has a lock to make sure that things are happening in order and not stamping all over each other. The logger gives you, these actually come in the standard library. There's quite a large selection of handlers. Obviously, your stream handler, which by default will, hand, will um, stream out to standard, uh, standard error. So you can just have it come out on the console. Or you can give it another stream to pass through some other file or whatever. There's an explicit file handler, which you tell it what file you want to log to. A null handler, which just drops it in the bin. I'm not sure of the use for that, but there it is. Watched file handler is really handy because it will watch the file and if somebody else writes to it or somebody else deletes it or truncates it, will close its handle and open it again so you can easily get your logs to restart. Rotating handler is a base class for rotating file handler and timed rotating file handler so you can either set a maximum size or a maximum age for the log file and have it rotate and continue. Socket handler and datagram handler are handy if you want to send your, your log messages over the wire to somebody else to handle. That can actually be a very efficient way because especially with datagram handler, uh, anyone who was here for Brianna's talk, it's a very similar solution to what CollectD does. Send it out as a UDP packet and forget about it. It's very efficient to get rid of. Syslog handler because we have syslog. NT event handler for a Windows version of the same thing, more or less. SMTP handler, because sometimes you want to email your admins on the weekend. They don't want you to, but you might want to. Uh, memory handler, because you just want to hold stuff in memory for a while. Maybe you're using it in testing, so you can get hold of the logs that you've, uh, you've put out. You can make a web request. And then the last two, queue handler and queue listener. Queue handler will push it into one of Python's queue classes, either a regular one or one of the other types that come along from async IO and, and threading and so on. And queue listener will actually consume from one of those queues. So you could potentially offload all your logging to one thread and let the others get on with their work. When you're configuring your logging, 
which is what a lot of people skip over. Configuring your logging is where a lot of the power really comes from. You will configure a number of loggers, which is where you send your messages in, and they will have a level to determine how much they squelch the messages coming in. Propagate, as we talked about before, a list of filters which allow you to control which messages actually get through, and a list of handlers that they're going to pass on successful messages to. Handlers will have, a, um, when you're configuring, you specify what the class is of the handler you're trying to configure, the level that it's going to squelch at, again, its own list of filters to decide on what to do, and perhaps a formatter for how it's going to format its messages. Formatters, you generally just give the actual format string, a Python format string normally, Date formats are how to specifically format dates for this case, so you can actually control that separately. And there's now, since 3.6 or 3.7, three different styles of formatting you're allowed to use because Python has so many different string formatting options now. And then there's filters, which are basically, most of the time you're going to use them, a function of the type record, where you get a log record and they return a bool to say whether or not to allow this message through. This is a relatively simple way of configuring your logging. You can import from um, logging.config, import dict config, which allows you to configure things just passing in a dictionary. There's also an any format one, but that's really tedious. Looks like a lot, but we'll break it down so we can see its simpler parts. The formatter is just a dict of named formats that you want to have. We're going to have a default one here, which just gives us the time, the level, the module, the line number, the messages, the actual message we're getting, and we're going to tell it that we're using format type formatting. You can get an awful lot of extra information that's all well tabled in the logging documentation, but this is an example of what you might want to log about something. Next is filters. Um, you might for instance, want to not log to certain things on the weekend. You might not want to SMS your admins or your ops team on the weekends or not during the week. You might have an emergency service that you only want to log to during the week and not the weekends. Then we have the handlers. So this is where the messages go out. Um, so here we have a simple example of a console we're calling it console. It's using the, uh, the stream handler, which means we haven't told it anywhere else to put it to. It's going to send it to standard error, which is basically on the console. Uh, but we're going to limit it to only warning level messages and above. Then we're going to have one we're going to call log file, and it uses the file handler, quite obviously, and we're going to tell it the file name we want to log to. Or email handler. Using email admin, we're going to sometimes annoy our admins, but not on the weekend. So we're going to specify a filter here on the outgoing messages to not send them on the weekend. But, um, sorry, only critical messages get sent. And then we configure our loggers. So here we have two entries. One is just for my app, and this is where the names actually start to be important. So when we asked for our logger, we gave it a name, and this is where it will look up the names. But the names don't actually have to match what's in the logging config, but I'll get to that in a minute too. So here we have my app, the basic logger, which only logs error level messages and above, and sends them straight to the log file. But we have this one module that's really troubling us, so we're going to put it on a debug logging, debug level logging, and it's also going to send to the console so we can see it. A different way to write this and get mostly the same effect would be to specify only the console handling and propagate as true. What happens with the names of your handlers is they're treated like a hierarchy based on the dot separators. So in our example, my app is a parent to my app troubling module. So any messages that the my app troubling module gets from any, any logger whose name begins with my app troubling module or anything longer than that, it will now catch here 
get debug level logging on that, but it will also propagate to its parent, which in our case is up here. So it'll still reach the log file, but it'll also go to the console. This means that you can very narrowly target bits of your code to say, in this part, I want to log it more closely for a while because it's giving us problems. Or this part, I don't want to hear about these messages. This is where the propagate and the parent part come in. Then there's the root logger, which is basically when none of those other messages match, none of those other loggers match what you're trying to send, what do we do with the messages? And it's just like all the other logger configs. In this case, we're just going to say it's going to go to the log file and we're going to email our admin in case there's a critical message from somewhere. Because if we remember, email admin handler limits to critical messages. So generally, your best practice when you're using logging is import logging and then get your own local logger based on your current module's name. So in Python, Dunder, name Dunder gives you your current module's import path. This way, you can very easily have your code logging hierarchical and therefore configure it based on your modules. Yeah? I'm not interested in logging from this module or any of its descendants, so I'll just turn that off. Or I am interested in this one at this level, but this part of it at a greater detail. Also, this leaves your logging configuration to your application, not your library, not your module. You can configure all of your logging and how detailed you want it from a global scope and still get localized configuration. Additionally, as I mentioned before, don't use the formatting when you're calling logging. Let the logging library do it for you. It's not a big win, but it can sometimes add up quite considerably. Some neat ticks and tips and tricks. One, you can use YAML. Who likes working with YAML over perhaps maintaining code or writing JSON by hand? Yeah, right. It's a little nicer to work with. So look, you read in YAML and guess what? It comes out as a dict, so why not? You can just pass it away and use dict config. Also, and someone was asking about this the other day, they wanted to track certain log messages and get some extra detail about it. Well, what actually happens is any extra information you pass in the extra keyword argument gets stuffed onto attributes on the log message. The log record carries this, so long as it's not of an existing attribute of the log, that will actually raise an error. So you can pass it along and have your filters or your handlers do magic things based on what you've actually passed along. Um, and I couldn't actually think of anything else to include in this talk because it was kind of rushed. So that's all. And have we any questions? <laughs> How do I do for time? Thank you, Curtis. We got some time for some questions. Uh, big surprise. Hello, thank you. I needed this so many years ago. A <laughs> um, couple of questions. First one is about uh, struct log. Do you have opinions about struct log? How does it relate to standard logging, etc.? I think using structured logging in general, just logging that logs actual structured records rather than strings is definitely the way forward now that that sort of thing is a lot cheaper and more efficient to use. And standard logging does not preclude this in any way. This is something else that I, I, I know we've had discussions on this before and I thought logging always logs strings. Well, no, it doesn't. The handler is not forced to do that. It can output any format you want to any, any target you want. So if you want to build a logger that outputs to your struct log service, whatever you're using, you can. It doesn't actually limit you to that. So they thought that far ahead. Hey, Curtis. Um, thanks for the talk. I've got um, a Django-specific question. Um, sort of two parts. Based on uh, what you've laid out, is there anything uh, magical or unexpected happening in the Django logging configuration and do you have any Django specific uh, sort of tips or best practices? Um, well, pretty much Django uses the, the dict config approach. I mean, in your settings pie, you'll find the logging setting is 
pretty much the same format I laid out there. Um, it should also include a version number, which I somehow managed to leave out from my talk. There you go. Oops. Um, there's no real magic to it. And again, Django tends to abide by the, the hierarchical log naming. So you can very easily say, OK, I don't want to hear from the Django library unless it's really bad, except for now I want to log all my SQL queries, so I'll set the logging lower, like debug or info level, on Django DB models, and then I can get all of that information. Or I want to hear errors from somewhere else and turn that on and turn that off. So no magic. <laughs> Sweet, thanks. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. Um, a quick question about modules. So if you, if you actually set up your logger, configure it uh, in your kind of your main, um, is there any sort of magic where you can then just use log, or do you have to put it into global, use it from there, or what's the, uh, uh, how do you pass around the log instances that you grabbed? Um, well, that's one of the joys is you don't have to. There's a, there's a global logging configuration so that when you create your logging config, when you call get logger, it's added to a global registry of, lo of named loggers. Um, and same with the handlers. There is actually a facility to allow you to run a network thread that will listen for log reconfigurations. This is built into the library too, but I don't think they make a big noise about it. Um, so in theory, you could actually connect to a socket that your task is running and ship it a new config that it will update its existing config with um, because it has that registry of, of all the different handlers. So it doesn't matter where you are in the code base and which library you're coming from. As long as we all play by this same simple rule, all of the logging will work together. You don't have to pass around logging, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi, guys. Thanks for the talk. Um, in, in your sample config that you just had, yes. uh, you had your most precise logger configured to write debug messages to the console. Yes. But then your handler, your console handler, you had um, filtered, the level filtered to warning. So will that only show warning level messages? So double, yeah. So you've got um, console debug going to console and then in the console handler, um, level warn. Yep. So, so we that, wouldn't see them. You That's won't right. see anything from so, them. So when the messages come in, I'll go back to my diagram because that's a good way of showing it. Come on. Where is it? There. Um, the logger itself has a level, so it can drop messages because of the level, and it has a bunch of filters, and it'll drop messages because of the filters. Anything that gets through all of that, it'll hand on to the handlers, which also have their own level and their own filters. So you've got this sort of uh, a mesh happening of everybody gets their own rules applied. Um, so yes, in that particular configuration, you wouldn't see your debug messages. And so that was probably an oversight on my configuration, but yes, you've got multiple points of, of being able to trim down how much noise gets through. Yeah, um, how do you recommend disabling the log handlers during unit tests? Um, you can reset the logging configuration if you really must. If you've imported everything and you're doing that. Um, alternatively, uh, you should be able to get in there and reset all the, um, all the handlers to work to be null handlers. But really, since all of the configuration of the logging is handled at your top level, if you're not running the application per se, but importing modules to call them, then you get to configure the logging before any of the modules that your unit testing run. So you can say, I want this to go to an in-memory handler and just read that. Hello, Curtis. Um, with testing, is it also possible to assert that logging calls are made? Um, well, you can mock part of your testing library if you really need to, or you can use things like the memory handler and so on to count how many messages got put in. Um, 
PyTest has its own log capture stuff, so for that, but I don't tend to think of PyTest by default because most people, well, not everybody uses PyTest. It's good, but not everybody uses it. Hi, I was just wondering, um, because of the complexity of logging, of, of logging in Python, um, it presents quite a barrier to entry for people who are very new to Python. Do you know if any, has any work been done to create a simplified logging framework that just gets you the basics? Well, um, that was part of why I did this talk. I didn't think logging itself is really that complex. There are a number of moving parts, but once you break them down, they're each quite simple. That said, as I showed in the very, very first slide, you can import logging and just log through it, which will use the root logger. Um, so you don't have to do anything. And you can very, very quickly use, there's a simple config option where you can pass just a few options to say, I want my level to be this, I want my destination to be that, my handler, yeah. And on the fly, you can also call add handler and so on to, uh, to make it. So yes, it can be done very simply for very simple cases. Um, your very simplest option is, as I showed, import logging and call the log messages. And that's very simple. If you then configure a handler to say, send my messages out there, you're done. Thank you, Curtis, for an excellent talk. Um, so when I first came across logging, um, I had some difficulties because I wanted to change the log level based upon parameters, uh, the arg pass that's coming through. Have you seen any good examples of that? And if it's too long, we can do it later. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've done it myself in a couple of programs based on environment variables. And you can just say, if they've set this variable, set this to debug, otherwise set it to... And because you can set all your levels in names instead of numbers, that can actually work very well. You can say log level equals info and just go with it. Um, or as an arg parse option, you know, dash dash debug will set the log level to debug. Or, so it's quite, you know, it, they've made a lot of small things that can make that life a lot easier. These lights are really bright. Are there, there's one more question. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so I just have a question with your email admin log, how you had it set to not on weekends. Yes. Is there, a, how would you implement if you wanted to say a critical level to bypass the not on weekends clause and actually, <sighs> what would, like, what, what, how would so you recommend you want, doing you, that? You want to say, don't email on weekends unless it's critical? Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> given the flexibility, you have a lot of choices. You could rewrite your not on weekends filter to say unless it's critical. Um, potentially, you could write a nested filter filter, but that's going a bit too far. Or you could write a separate um, handler to say critical messages handle always. Everything else handle, but not on weekends. All right, more questions? Going once, twice, all right. Thank you, Curtis. Woohoo!